All righty. Uh, uh, thanks very much for that introduction, Catherine. And thanks to all of you for finding time this morning to share a few thoughts I've got here on communication and narrative. Um, actually, the very first thing to say is, um, okay, you had mentioned about asking questions. And that is the essence of good science. I remember back when I was an undergraduate listening to postdocs and graduate students and faculty and they, they were always saying what what makes a good scientist it's the ability to ask good questions that's the core of science it's also at the core of narrative as we're going to talk about so lots to go through in this hour-long session um by the way i don't have any cards with me but there's my email address and please don't hesitate to send me emails later any questions if you want to have a phone call to discuss this stuff um story circles i'm going to tell you about any old thing Let's see i'm going to turn these mics away here and here's basically what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you a talk for about 30 minutes or so on narrative and that sort of stuff. Have this structure, set up problem, solution, very simple. Then have a few questions. Then I've had a few quote volunteers who have given me their one sentence ABT summaries of the narratives of projects that they work on. And we'll try and get through a few of those. And what I do is put them up there and give you thoughts and comments and kind of interact with the person who wrote them. So uh, before I even get started on this presentation, I want to share with you a little experience that I had last week, which is um, in addition to working in science communication, I'm still a filmmaker and also an avid surfer. And right now uh, in the middle of doing a documentary about a famous surfer who died 25 years ago, and we're interviewing some of the surfers who knew him. And last week we did an interview with this fellow, Alan Sarlo, one of the greatest big wave surfers of all time. And this is my buddy, Brian Bielman, who was doing the questions in the interview. And we started this interview and we talked to Alan a few times before and he was really clear on the story he was gonna tell us. And all of a sudden we start the interview and the, uh, Brian asked the first question, Alan starts giving these weird answers and kind of looking all around the place, can't seem to focus and just nonsensical all over the place talking about other people that he knew. Um, Brian kept trying to get him to focus on the guy we were interested in. After a while, he started telling stories about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And we were just sitting there, what in the world is going on here? And it finally got so nonsensical. I honestly thought that he was having an aneurysm. I thought maybe the pressure of being in front of the camera had stressed him out so much. So I kind of stood up and called it off. I said, oh, this is great. We're all done for today. Way to go. Um, and then we go in the kitchen and his wife and daughter are laughing hysterically. And we said, wow, what just happened? And Brian was asking me, was I asking bad questions? What went on here? And they said that morning, Alan had gone surfing at first point in Malibu and stepped on a stingray and got stung on his foot. And he spent a half an hour laying in the bathtub crying, saying this is the worst pain he'd ever experienced in his life. They finally took him to the emergency room where they cleaned up the wound and last thing gave him two Vicodins. Uh, <laughs> and he didn't want to cancel the interview and didn't have the heart to tell us. He was afraid if he told us that he'd was drugged up, we'd cancel it, so he tried his best. And when we finally heard that, we burst out laughing. We go back to the living room, there he is laying face down, passed out on the carpet. So um, anyhow, that was my experience last week. Now you're wondering, why would I share such a bizarre story? And the reason is, it demonstrates the very thing I'm here to talk to you about, which is narrative structure, which is not just at the core of stories, it's at the core of everything. It's at the core of all human communication going back thousands of years. So take a look at what I just told you there. Um, Alan's a famous surfer, and we tried to interview him, but he produced nonsense, therefore we cut the interview short, but then they told us that uh, he got stung by the stingray, therefore be using that footage in the outtakes, I'm sure the peanut butter and jelly sandwich stuff in particular. Um, and so this is the basic structure, and it's three fundamental forces, we're going to talk about this agreement, contradiction, consequence, but the three words that embody those forces the most, best are and, but, and therefore, those come together in the template called the ABT and what I've been developing, especially since that book in 2015, it's called the ABT framework. That's what I'm here to present to you because it's very powerful for communication. So let me start by giving you a little bit of background on myself. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I was a scientist. I became a filmmaker. And this is the first presentation I have ever given where I'm gonna begin by inviting you to ask the skeptical question of me, which is, um, should we listen to this guy? And a lot of you, probably most of you are academic scientists and I was one once and 49% of my brain is still programmed that way. And so if I were in the audience, I'd be sitting there with my arms folded saying, who is this clown from outside the academic world? And so let me first argue in that direction, which is no, you shouldn't listen to me. Um, I left the academic world 25 years ago, 1994. 
there wasn't even hardly an internet back then. Email was hardly used at all. Uh, uh, there was none of this impact factor stuff that you guys live your lives by nowadays, I guess. I, you know, that's all come around in the years since I left. So it's been bizarre for me hearing about it from my old colleagues and I just haven't been that much a part of that world. So that's one of several reasons that you could cling on to to dismiss everything I have to tell you here. But now let me argue on my behalf on why you ought to listen to me, even though I'm outside the ivory tower, outside the academic world for 25 years. First off, I got a PhD from a respectable place. Secondly, I spent five years as a postdoctoral fellow in the mid 1980s at the height of the Reagan era, just a miserable time for academics because funding was cut back so much for programs and the job market dried up to next to nothing. I'm sure it's as tough as ever today, but back then it was unbelievable. I remember there was an evolutionary ecologist position advertised for UC San Diego that got over 750 applicants. The job that I finally did get uh, after five years of applying as an assistant professor had 180 applicants for that one position. So I basically ran the gauntlet, paid my dues, became a professor, was there for six years, had the graduate students, got the NSF grants, um, published 20 some papers and finally achieved tenure. So I went the whole distance, um, but, and here's this and but therefore template in the works for you. But along the way, I began to develop this interest, a bigger interest in communication and the way in which science gets communicated, I was fascinated by it. And of all the different experiences back there, one of the most important kind of formative experience I had was in 1993, the movie Jurassic Park came out. And you may remember it was not just a blockbuster, but it had a cultural impact. And dinosaur museums were inundated with everybody wanting to come in and look at dinosaurs like never before. It had that big of an impact. But what I noticed also was an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education that talked about how graduate programs in paleontology saw a spike in applications. And that's what captured my interest. What did Hollywood know that they knew how to motivate students better to go directions than the academic world itself knew? And that's a lot of what drew me eventually into deciding I wanted to get deeper in this communication thing, realizing I wouldn't be able to pursue it inside the ivory tower. I was going to have to venture out. And that's what I ended up doing. I went to film school at University of Southern California, went to the graduate production program 25 years ago, got out, made films for 15 years. And then starting a decade ago, began publishing uh, four books that I've written now. And two of those have been with academic presses. So I never ventured that far from the academic world. And the first one from my own press, the second from University of Chicago Press, which is the largest academic press in North America. And nowadays run the story circles program I'm gonna be talking to you about that we're doing with a lot of universities and government agencies, things like that. So even though I am from outside that realm of academia, I'm still on the fringes of it. And let's now start to descend into the problem that we're here to talk about, which is this challenge of communication, not just to the outside world, but even challenge within the academic world. And let me now talk a little bit more about not just this movie and book Jurassic Park, but the author of it, Michael Crichton, because he was a very important character. And the more I've gotten to know about him, the more I'm coming to label his whole life's work as a missed opportunity for the science world. So the story with him, he also was a scientist turned filmmaker. He did, went to medical school at Harvard, did his residency there, was headed into a biomedical research career, even did a postdoc just up the road here at the Salk Institute before leaving for Hollywood. But to support himself, he began ghostwriting um, kind of techno thriller novels, which ended up becoming very popular. And eventually Andromeda Strain was a bestseller in Hollywood, turned it into a movie. And so at that point, he decided to make the jump and, and move and go to Hollywood. And so he was very successful in the academic world. And then once he got to Hollywood, he was unbelievably successful, like nobody ever before. He was the first guy in 1994, the first person ever to have the simultaneous number one book movie and TV show. Nobody had ever done that before. So he had so much knowledge of Hollywood and he didn't come at it as some sort of goofball or clown or anything like that. He was highly respected and, and he was a giant in addition physically, he was six foot 10. And people like Steven Spielberg, both literally and figuratively looked up to him. Um, so he had so much knowledge to share on communication with the science world but the science world rebuffed him. And for 25 years, he kept trying, writing essays and papers and giving talks to try and offer this advice up. Finally culminating in 1999 with the keynote address he gave at AAAS and the guy who organized that, Mike Strauss, is now my collaborator in my story circles program. So I've heard about this first person, what happened, which is they, the science community just didn't listen to him. I think in part because he was from outside the realm. 
and that they just dismiss you at that point. That's the challenge. So more specifically, let me tell you about the real missed opportunity. And this is something that nobody, it's been lost to time basically. And it's one of my missions to try and bring this back up, remind people of this. In 1975, just before he left the Salk Institute, he published a short note in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what he did was one day sitting at his desk, picked up three issues of the New England Journal of Medicine, took one paper each from the three issues and ran through it and put together a list of the top 10 basically communication mistakes that were made, all of which lead to a single word that he boiled it down to, which is obfuscation. This was the title of his note, Medical Obfuscation, Structure and Function. And it was about this language that exists in this academic world that takes things that are in, at their core relatively simple, but communicates it in such a way so obfuscated and twisted around that you just can't follow what's going on there. So in this short note, he goes through that, the 10 characteristics he, he found of obfuscation, then has a short discussion at the end that says a number of very profound things. And here's two things that he say that are so important. He said, um, contrary to popular belief, there's little historical precedent for bad writing. That's so important because you run into people who say, you know, scientists, they've always been bad at communication. You just kind of have to accept that. No, they haven't. A century a year ago, scientists spoke clearly and plainly. How do we know this? First off, they had to because there weren't any government agencies handing out money to them. They had to con convince people to give them money. So they had to have communications to do that uh, skills. They, had, they were more grounded in the humanities. And most importantly was a century ago is when they came together and established this convention that exists to the present called the IMRAD template. So all of these papers you read and write day in and day out have these four major sections, introduction, methods, results, and discussion. That is the template that a century ago, they had the good sense to come together and know we've got to have this narrative structure under how we communicate. Otherwise, we're going to have an inefficient mess. So they understood it back then. Now look at this other sentence at the bottom here. Only in the 20th century has obfuscation become widely acceptable. How do I know this is true? Because I did the science career. I sat through hundreds of talks, read papers that were incredibly obfuscated with this garbled language, this overly complicated, almost double speak at times. So this is what he was addressing there. You would have hoped in 1975, this paper would have been a landmark. Everybody would have come together and said, oh my goodness, he's right. We've got to work on this to reverse it. But that's not happened at all. It was lost to time. I did a recent search on it in a science citation index. It's been cited 82 times since 1975. It just didn't have any impact at all. Now, let's take that observation to the more specific level because I guarantee you can see it in pretty much any discipline you look at, but let's talk about it for climate science. So most of you are probably familiar with the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change that for the past few decades has been trying to pull together the science of the world to understand what's going on with the climate. And every three or four years, they issue a report that is a big fat thing. And then along with it comes this short three or four paragraph statement called the Summary for Policymakers. Well, good friend of mine, John Sturman in 2008, did a little experiment that he published in science. He is uh, at MIT and he pulled together 200 graduate students in science and math at MIT, had them read the summary for policymakers from the previous year's report, 2007, and then asked them in just two or three sentences of their own to simply explain what is the science saying in this, this um, summary and found that 84% of them got it wrong. So even graduate students in science and math at MIT could not follow the, the communication that was going on in this super important report in which the summary for policymakers described as this is the place where we're gonna to explain to the general public for the non-technical people and even these folks couldn't understand it. You might've hoped that that would have been a landmark in all the science, climate science world would have sat up and said, we gotta address this thing. Well, in 2015, Tolufson, another paper in Nature, um, addressed the same problem, this time using the Fleisch reading ease score and showed that these summary for policymakers since the early 90s have gone straight downhill, gotten more and more difficult to read. So the bottom line is the more information we gather, the more knowledge, the worse the communication is getting, and that's true in, in all these disciplines. Um, so that's the basic problem is what are you gonna do when you start? It, it's, in some ways, it's an exercise in entropy. You get all this stuff just spewing all over the place. How do you make order out of it? That's what you're faced with communication. And so now let's talk about what the solution is. And here's kind of the sad news, which is the solution to this problem really comes down to this. Um, so <laughs> this, believe it or not, is humanity's greatest hope. Uh, my good friend, Brian Palermo, 
who later this morning, 11 o'clock, will be doing a workshop. Brian, can you stand up and say howdy to everybody? And Brian, how much background do you have in science? <laughs> Very little. Brian is not a scientist, and yet he has the, sk the skills that are essential for communication, not just broad communication, but even within your discipline. Trust me, I did that whole academic career. I went to Hollywood, and this is what my journey of 40 years has led me to the realization that you are not going to solve this problem from inside the academic community. And sadly, the National, Science, uh, National Academy of Sciences for 10 years has been running a very misguided program called the Science of Science Communication, which sends the signal that if we just do enough science on how to communicate, we can put together the algorithm the rhythms that will eventually show us how to, the way. And that just isn't true. You need the humanities. That's the, the conundrum you face. And so Brian is an actor, and he's trained in improv acting, and he's incredibly charismatic. Um, I challenge you to see how charismatic he is when he runs his session. And if he's not as charismatic as I'm hyping him to be, you can come complain to me. But I've been working with him for 10 years, and he's very awesome in teaching you these basic skills for communication. And what he and I present together, we do workshops together a lot, um, are complementary. So communication falls into two parts, substance and style. What I'm talking to you about here is narrative structure, which is mostly the substance, how you rearrange the information to get the optimal form that people will be able to understand it. What he focuses on is style, how you actually present it in person and all these human elements that, um, that actors and people in Hollywood have got down really well. And that's what I learned in my journey there. And in fact, my first book, Don't Be Such a Scientist, was mostly built around the two-year intensive Meisner acting program that I took that was a shock to my system. But as I processed it over the course of 15 years, I slowly came to realize that, wow, that's got all the knowledge that you need for this stuff. So, um, now let's get more specific to what the, the absolute solution is, and it all boils down to this one word. And the reason I, that I um, point or introduce Brian right at this point is that uh, seven or eight years ago, 10 years ago, he and I and another colleague, Dory Barton, who's also an actor, the three of us ran a workshop for about three years. And in that workshop, I talk, talked a lot about, I used the word narrative and storytelling over and over again. And Brian began to kind of annoy me in some ways and that he would say, what's the difference between these two words, narrative and storytelling? And I would say, oh, they're, you know, they're basically the same. They kind of overlap each other. You can't pull them apart. And he said, well, I think you owe it to the participants here to actually figure out, especially the science folks, they're pretty analytical and they would appreciate you're boiling it down into some clear definition. Well, after about two years of him bringing that up over and over again, I began to slowly hear him, by the way, one of the shortcomings of academics is you don't have as good ability to listen as you really ought to. That's what the improv acting uh, teaching gives you is a better ability to listen, which is crucial in communication. And so finally hearing him, I began to dig into the literature and read books and think about, think about this. And then finally did come up with a simple definition, which is in that 2015 book. I laid it out there and I stick with it. And so here's the simple definition of narrative. It's, I define it as the series of events that occur in the search for the solution to a problem. Now, what, what's important here is this basic problem-solution dynamic. That's what's at the core of effective communication, particularly in science when you've got a lot of information, but science itself is simply an exercise in solving problems. And so that's the challenge is can you boil all that stuff down at the end of the day into what's the core problem you're addressing and how are you going about trying to solve it? So that's at the core of so many things. And narrative then, People like to talk about, you know, we are storytelling animals and we've been telling stories since back in cave times, sitting around the campfire, everybody told stories. That's true, but at the core of a story is this narrative dynamic of problem solution dynamic. Every good story ever told has got that as the core dynamic. Every murder mystery, there's a problem, who done it, and the whole thing is a journey to try and solve it. That's the narrative dynamic. The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy gets sent to the Land of Oz, she's got a problem how to get back to Kansas. The whole movie is her journey trying to solve this problem to get her way back to Kansas. When you start looking at it, you see it everywhere. And in fact, this has been understood to some extent and talked about and thought about going back thousands of years, starting with the Greeks, going back to Aristotle and the poetics in there. He talked about the structure of the plays that they would put on and he identified a five part structure, which was just basically beginning, middle and end, which he split the middle into three parts. And by the 1700s, the great philosophers, Hegel and Kant and others, talked about the triad, which is thesis, antithesis, synthesis. It's the same three-part structure, which is how the brain is programmed. It's how we think. 
Gustav Freitag in the 1800s formalized it for theater, the three-act structure, which is the same thing it's taught in film school today on how you write screenplays. Joseph Campbell, the anthropologist, mythologist, came along in the 1940s and did a comparative study of storytelling around the world to see if there was any commonality in the structure of how stories were, tell, were told. And in fact, he identified what's called the monomyth, which is just a little bit more elaborate version of this three-part structure. But it all keeps coming back to this. George Lucas used his teachings in the creation of Star Wars that made tons and tons of money for people. Uh, Frank Danielle was a screenwriting guru. I was lucky enough to have his class the year before he passed away. He was still teaching at USC. In the 1980s, in a speech, he, as far, I've been researching this, and as far as I can tell, he was the first guy in the speech in 1986 to talk about this simple dynamic in which he said, here's the deal with, with writing and telling stories, is that we always begin by making the mistake of the first draft being a story of and then, and then, and then, just a listing of events, just and, 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 and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. It's in the revisions that you go back in and you begin to replace those and thens with the words either but or therefore. When you add in buts and therefores, you begin to change the direction, start to add all the, you know, the complexity and sort of texture of storytelling. So that's the first mention I could find of that. Then of all the crazy things in 2011, the co-creators of South Park did a documentary on Comedy Central that I watched. And in there, they talked about what they called their rule of replacing. And they said, every week we get the script for our show. And once we get a first draft, we sit down, we go back in the script. And every time we see the word and, we ask ourselves, could we replace that and with either a but or a therefore? I had been through film school in the mid 90s. I had had five writing courses and I had never heard story structure conveyed in such simple terms. But if there's one thing I knew from my science career, it's the power and importance of simplicity when you're trying, that's, that's what science is, trying to find these simple formulae and theories that, un, that can explain a great deal of variation. So when I heard that, I was stunned. I called my screenwriting friends all through Hollywood and they all said, we've never heard that before, but it makes total sense, kind of fits right into the, uh, all of Joseph Campbell's teachings. And so I then began to, to mold that into this template of ABT and but therefore, gave a TED Med talk on it in 2014, published the Houston book in 2015. And the Houston book is kind of the manifesto that lays out this whole framework of ABT. And in the meanwhile, over the past decade, neurophysiologists have begun to do the first kind of preliminary work on looking at how the brain responds to narrative structure. And one uh, fellow in particular, Yuri Hassan at Princeton, has done kind of pioneering work where they put people into the MRI machine, they do functional MRI, and they have subjects watch films that either do have narrative structure and don't, um, or they listen to audio that is telling a story and doesn't tell a story. And here's what they find is the brain basically has two simple modes. Either you're in the narrative world where that we've got a problem, or you're in the non-narrative world. You wake up in the morning, you're laying there in bed and everything's peaceful and your brain's on idle and windows open and the breeze is blowing in and you hear the birds chirping out there and everything's great you're in the non-narrative world. But then your cell phone goes off and there's a text message saying the FedEx package you expect that morning is gonna be delayed by a day. Now you've got a problem, you jump out of bed and now you're in the narrative world, but you're not getting that package, therefore you better figure out how to solve that. This is what the results look like when they do these studies is that when people are shown a video that has, doesn't have narrative structure, it's just video of a camera sitting in a park, people are walking around randomly, there's no problem going on. There's very little of the brain is active, and more importantly, they calculate an index of similarity. And from one person to the next, there's a great deal of variation. You know, different people have different parts of their brain active. They're just basically rambling, as happens in a bad presentation where people aren't following what's going on. You're, you know, working on your checkbook or your laundry for the weekend, or who knows what. Um, in contrast, when you show people a film that does have narrative structure, namely what they used was a murder mystery from Alfred Hitchcock, there's very clear, you know, who done it? We've got a problem there. And first off, a lot more of the brain is active. And secondly, the index of similarity is much higher, like 70%. And not surprisingly, everybody's watching this thing. They're all thinking the same thing, you know, who done it, and all the different suspects. That's what you want when you're giving a science presentation is everybody's brains to be activated like that because they're all focused on the problem that you've presented very clearly and you're leading them on a journey now to try and find a solution to it. So when you start to think of these two um, worlds of narrative, non-narrative, then uh, communications people love to tell you all about, you, know, you need to know your audience and that's absolutely true. Well, let me give you this as a simple representation of what's meant by that, which is 
there's two basic audiences. First off, there's what we could call the inner group. And this is kind of like everybody from your lab that has been working on your same system for years and heard you give talks and they know your whole system and you don't need this narrative stuff for them. That's what's so wonderful sitting around talking with them. You don't have to begin with a big introduction. They're already in the depth of your, your system. Um, and then there's everybody else that doesn't know your system that well. Now, the real tough question, particularly for lots of scientists, is how big is that blue circle? And that's where a lot of mistakes get made. And by the way, that's what I did as a scientist. That's why I had seven NSF proposals rejected. Uh, I did work that was you know, identified in review papers as being innovative and pioneering, but I always wrote these proposals with this basic assumption of my work's so important, you've gotta give me this money. Um, and I assumed that everybody out there knew why it was important and what the questions are working on. And I was terrible with that part. This has been part of my learning process over the years is realizing that that circle, all else equal, you should err in the direction of assuming it's smaller than it maybe even is. Turns out even a lot of your colleagues really don't know your system that well or following you. So what that means is that with that inner group, they're wonderful to sit around and chat with because you can just go and, and, and. You can go through all these facts and they're already interested in that. You don't need to motivate them. But for everybody else, you need this ABT basic structure that the brain is programmed with, which is basically set up problem solution. So you begin to look around in our world and you see this structure everywhere the more you look for it, starting with nursery rhymes. Little Miss Muppet sat on a tuffet and she was eating her curds and whey, but Long came a spider who sat down beside her and therefore frightened Miss Muppet away. All the most popular nursery rhymes have got that structure. Great speeches, great movies. You see it over and over again, these three, this three-part structure. Here's an example for you. Um, for, this is actually from last week. I spoke at a biotech conference, used this as an example. You know, imagine that I own a small startup company working on a, a cure for cystic fibrosis. This might be my one sentence ABT. And by the way, my good friend, Park Howell, who's the host of a podcast called The Business of Story, um, loves the ABT template so much, he uses it all through his workshops now, and he refers to it as the one floor elevator pitch. So this is boiling your whole pitch down so concisely, you could say it in one sentence in one floor. Uh, cystic fibrosis afflicts 30,000 US by shortening their lifespan, and we think gene transfer is the possible cure, but here's the problem. So far, the techniques have, have been inefficient. Therefore, in my lab, we're developing, or my company, a, a different method of gene transfer we think will be more efficient. That's it's still very general. It's not telling you a lot of specifics, but it's the general problem, the setup, the problem, and what we're doing about it. And that's what you want. And ideally, it doesn't bore anybody. It doesn't confuse them because it's concise and reasonably compelling. So as I say, I presented this in the book, Houston, We Have a Narrative. Um, and I felt that the ABT template is so powerful that it's something that needs to be worked with because there's more to it than just learning the three words. We began to realize we started to work with it. That it embodies these three forces, agreement, contradiction, consequence. And then what you wanna do is begin to work with this stuff and get it to the level of being intuition. And in fact, this is another thing I learned from, from Brian and the, the Groundlings Improv Comedy folks. For 20 years, I've been working with them, taking classes in improv acting, which is incredibly powerful. And by the way, you know, the, the improv approach got a nice validation 10 years ago when um, uh, SUNY Stony Brook named their Center for Science Communication after Alan Alda, the great improv actor. And that was, I think, a good validation of why this stuff is really important uh, in the science world. But one of the things I heard from Brian and, and his fellow improv actors, they like to talk about improv as being, think of it as like a muscle that you need to condition over time. So he'll do a little workshop with you this morning, but that's just a little taste of what it's like if you really are serious about it. Uh, actually, there've been a lot of scientists I know who have written to me and said, you know what, I just signed up and started taking this improv class. So it's week after week, and it's like a muscle that you need to go to the gym and condition and strengthen it over time. You can't do it in a single day. And I began to realize that's the same thing with this narrative stuff. You can learn, Dan, but therefore right here this morning, but really figuring out the dynamics of it, there's a fractal nature to it. It's, it's a piece of simplicity that the more you work with it, you begin to realize it radiates out into infinite complexity. So at the end of this book, I proposed the idea of how we're gonna train people in this and outline what we call story circles and narrative training. We've been developing it for five years now, and now we're scaling it up and working with a lot of organizations. And what we've developed is a two-step model. So the first thing we realized, this takes a fair amount of effort. It's not something you can force students or graduate students, anything like that, into it. They need to really have motivation, because again, it's like going to the gym and lifting weights. You know, you don't want to force somebody to do that. You kind of need to go on your own motivation. And so the first step of the training is what we call a demo day, where we pull together usually around 40 people or so, 35 or 40, 
And it's a one day, it's not a workshop, it's really introducing them to, in the morning, the ABT framework, in the afternoon, at the exercises that they'll be doing in the actual training. At the end of the day, then people sign up. Usually out of 40 people doing the demo day, about 15 or 20 sign up. Then the host institution over the next few days, weeks or months, begin to pull together groups of fives and those become the individual circles. So a circle is uh, five individuals who will meet um, for 10 sessions for one hour each. And those actually work great over Zoom, you know, or remote uh, teleconferencing. The demo day needs to be in person, but once you make the circles, we found long ago that they're really great over teleconferencing. And then week after week, it's, there's no lectures, no notes. It's just all intuition building. It's not like a college course where you're working on intellect and you have new lectures, new topics, and new speakers and new readings. There's none of that. This is all down at the intuitive level. It's the practical side of building this, conditioning this muscle basically week after week. Uh, this is what's happened with Story Circles. You can see we began with some prototypes in the beginning, slowly developing it with NIH and USDA, and then now have really got the working model. And a few agencies, namely the National Park Service, has really taken to it. We've got about five or six demo days happening this fall with them and spreading elsewhere. This is what a circle looks like. This is one of the circles at National Park Service. They began this tradition in the 10th session. They usually have somebody bakes an ABT cake uh, and we give them certificates. And after the 10, in the 10 sessions, you begin to see the beginnings of this development of intuition. People begin to understand these basic elements of the and but therefore, the powers that they embody, and they can begin to look at text and spot that's narrative, that's non-narrative, that's overly narrative, it's confusing. And let me say a few words now about how this applies in your world. Um, Catherine and I traded a couple of emails a few weeks ago about some of the things you work on. And so first off, this is a super powerful tool to help you boil down the essence of what it is in your whole program. And in a few minutes, um, let's see how we're doing for time here, good, okay. In a few minutes, we'll, um, I'll run through a few that, that some folks have, have sent me. Um, and what you see is that uh, you can't nail this thing in one day. It's something you work on for days and weeks and you go to the gym or you go out for a run or a walk or something like that, you go for a swim and you distill this. It turns out physical activity is a really important part of the process. You can sit at your desk and start on it, but a lot of times you need to be out doing physical things and your brain gauges differently. But eventually you begin to distill this thing down. And as I'll say in a few minutes, the goal is to come up with this one sentence that's both concise and yet still compelling. If you strip it down too much, it's no longer compelling. If it's too got too much compelling stuff, it's not concise and it's clunky. It's a very important tool for many things. It becomes the blueprint of your project. Every laboratory should know what your ABT basically is a simple rule. If nothing else from this talk, you know, you should walk away with that and just ask yourself, what's the ABT of our project that we're doing here? That should be really clear in your mind. Um, it's a great tool for understanding how to build consensus and how to cross cultural divides because the three forces are, and is the most common word of agreement. That's how you begin effective communication and narrative. You begin with what we can agree on. Before we get to you know, what the problem is, first we wanna all make sure we're in the same world and that's what you need to be searching for when you've got two different labs coming together. What have we got for common ground before we get into the problems we're working on? So it's a tool that you can use to build the intuition that, that intuitively guides you to know how to hold conversations where you're no longer thinking, what was that recipe? It just comes out of you naturally. One of the rules that happens with a lot of people running communications workshops where they don't really quite know what they're doing is they'll tell you a blanket rule, never use jargon, especially with the public. That's not true. Always use narrative. And it turns out if you do a good job with narrative, jargon can be one of the most powerful things of all. Because if I can tell you a story that begins in your world, very simply, you can connect with that. And if I can slowly bring you around to this world of science, I can eventually dig you down deep where this one complicated concept and term and even piece of jargon can be really cool because you now understand what it is. It's a fact that if I begin with jargon, then that can immediately disconnect. I'm lost, I don't know what we're talking about. So that's the challenge. But you know, a show like CSI, there's tons of jargon in that. The audiences love it. It's just put in the right place narrative so people understand what's going on with it. The ABT is a great tool for assessing consistency. If you've got five people working on a project and just sit them down and say, they don't even have to have any training in the ABT, just say off the top of your head, write me a sentence with these words and but therefore that tells what we're doing here. In theory, all, people should, all five people should write almost the same sentence. But if you get five completely different sentences, you've probably got a problem there. You've got people on a different wavelength. That actually happened to me a couple years ago with a corporate team that they had me meet with their branding team. And I did that on the spot. 
kind of caught them off guard and their five global branding officers wrote it out and all five had completely different narratives for what their company was. And the head guy turned to me and said, do you think we have a problem here? And I said, yeah, yeah. everybody's got a different story for what you guys do. Um, and if you have interviews you're gonna do or press conference where you've got questions you know you're gonna be asked, it's a super powerful tool to, for rehearsal. Make sure you know what's your ABT answer to this question because what you don't want is to get stuck like a deer in the headlights and go into and, 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 and we're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, and the you know, interview is like trying to figure out where to cut you off. You wanna set it up and get right to, you know, the main problem we're working on is this and therefore we're doing this. So that's some of the basics of the ABT template. Um, there's a lot of aspects that go with it. And as I said, you know, it needs the 10 weeks really to start to develop intuition. But once you do, we've now had over 500 graduates from the training. And for five years or four years, people were saying, what's your metrics? What's your proof this actually works? And all we could point to was that graph that shows, you know, just through word of mouth, people are propagating it. Uh, this last spring, we finally did the first survey. And the most powerful thing in there was 120 gra recent graduates. We asked them, um, we gave them three blanks and said, can you tell us one, two, or three little anecdotes of how you've been applying the ABT framework that you picked up in this training? And we got back 130 stories that are all on the website there. And when you start to read through that, you start to see, oh my goodness, they're using it for their staff, for their, um, their assistants, for their lab, for their proposals, their presentations. It applies in all these different sorts of things. So it's very powerful. Um, and as I said, there's my email address. Do not hesitate. I'm not getting paid for this today. The only payment I get is if some of you hopefully write me an email just saying something, even disagreeing and debating with me about everything I presented here. So that's the thing that I most look forward to is hearing from you. And again, glad to do phone calls if you wanna talk about it in greater depth. Um, so on that, that's kind of the basics. And before I jump into this little exercise of a few ABTs, uh, anybody got any questions, comments, thoughts that you want to share? I think we've got microphones here. Oh, and while we're doing this, how about if we pass out the cards to everybody? Um, any comments, questions? Yes, right here. Yes. Oh, the business of story. Yes, yeah, from Park Howell. And yeah, that's a great, I've been on there four times, so I'm kind of repeat guest. He's done over 200 episodes now. And actually, there's a wonderful most recent episode last week, I think, with uh, Chapman Downs, who's a friend of mine, who's a producer of HBO Real Sports. And it's an hour long discussion with him that has got, that's, people have asked me for years, you know, what's the best show on TV for science communication uh, for the general public? And I've always said, if uh, HBO Real Sports with Brian Gumbel ever did something on science, that would be the best thing ever. And three years ago, they finally did. They did a segment about the Great Barrier Reef climate change in Australia and they did a perfect job on it. I wrote a, pod, uh, a blog post about it, and the producer got in touch with me and said, hey, thanks for all the compliments, and we'd become buddies, and he's on that this last week. Um, another thought, comment, question. Oh, there we go. Yes. Uh, Prakashan is here. Yes. Uh, when you write the re real scientific stuff, you mentioned that it's kind of boring for the people, but when you make the movie, you have to make it interesting. How much do you have to deviate from the real facts to make it interesting? Oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's a really great, great question. Okay, um, so if you're lazy and don't wanna put any effort in, so he asked how much do you have to deviate from the actual facts to make it work with this narrative stuff? And if you're lazy, then you know, it's really easy. You can just make up things and get it all wrong, and that's what your worst nightmare is in the science world. But if you're good at this, if you've developed narrative intuition, and if you put in the time, your challenge, I mean, it's an this is why this stuff is so important. It's why I've put 40 years of my life into it, is that the challenge is really large for you, which is you're constrained by the facts. I made a movie called Block of Dodos in 2006 that was on Showtime for two years. And at the end of it, that's what I talked about, that the scientists are stuck with this handicap that you're, you're constrained by the truth and the facts, which means it's more challenging definitely, but all the more reason to rise that challenge because if you spend enough time thinking about it, looking at it from different perspectives, rearranging it, you can finally land on, wow, here's a good way to tell this story that actually will engage people. Um, it's really challenging. I'll give you one little example of that. Uh, the story of Mozart hung around Hollywood for decades. Everybody wanted to make a movie about the story of Mozart and his life just wasn't that interesting because he was a boy genius, he was a teen genius, he was a genius when he died. There wasn't an arc to his life. He was just the same character all along. 
it took a playwright to finally write a play that told the story of Mozart's life, not just straight on literal about Mozart, but through the eyes of Salieri, his bitter rival, who in the beginning thought he was an equal to Mozart and then was forced throughout his life to slowly accept that, no, that guy's a genius, you're a schmuck. Um, and that's the basic story arc. And, that, and that's the movie Amadeus, you know, which is a masterpiece. And that's what happened was that event, and that all worked within the facts. It's just that they kind of shifted the frame, basically. People like to talk about framing. So instead of just talking to the one guy, let's look at him through a different set of eyes and bingo. Suddenly you've got a really compelling story that draws you in following the human story. And along the way, you get to, to learn all the information about Mozart. That's the fundamental challenge is that a lot of these stories seem boring like Mozart's life, but if you can weave it into something parallel to it that's really got these human story dynamics, you can make it work. That's how challenging the stuff is. Yeah. <laughs> But French, for instance. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, please ask that of the mic can, with the microphone, can you? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, what is the cultural bias? Do you think this is going to work in any other yes. language yes, like yes. French? Okay, so simple answer on that if you're really deeply interested in that question. Um, one of the fundamental books of Hollywood is called The Writer's Journey by Christopher Vogler. So I showed you in that little thing there about Joseph Campbell created the monomyth. George Lucas applied it to make Star Wars a huge hit. Christopher Vogler, then with the mind, an analytical mind like a scientist, came along in the 1990s and first wrote an internal memo at Disney in which he explained to everybody, all the writers at Disney, look, the reason this Star Wars thing works is because he's tapped into the power of myth, Joseph Campbell, and basically the structural templates there. His memo was so popular that he turned it into a book that's now in its third edition. And the preface to the second edition, again, Christopher Vogler, The Writer's Journey, in the preface, he writes a 14-page preface to the second edition that's really brilliant. And he talks about exactly that. And he says, does this monomyth structure that Joseph Campbell described hold up for, um, first off, is it, is it so male oriented that it doesn't hold for women's stories, things like that? And more importantly, is all these different cultures around the world. And as he points out, there are certain cultures that have problems with the word heroes, namely Germany. Um, they've had some heroes kind of jump the track. Um, and Australia is really an anti-hero and even the British they are um, not real fond of heroes. So there's variations, but at the end of the day, the programming of the brain is still pretty much this problem, set up problem solution. That's the core dynamic that gets beyond that hero thing. So there are definitely variations, but guarantee when you look deep enough into all that work of the French, um, it's, it's either ABT or it's more artistic and creative, which then starts to drift off more towards the end and end structure and even DHY, which is, uh, is an excessive amount of narrative. So the art world tends to be float away from the ABT structure. Does that make sense? So the, the ABT structure is kind of the mass template for everybody. And art usually is a much smaller crowd. That's why art, the art house theaters, you know, they play to smaller audiences and they tend to vary away from that, that core dynamic, but kind of starts with understanding that, yes. Oh, sorry, here, yes. Here. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, I completely agree that we should do more to explain science to a larger audience. Um, I work for science publisher Elsevier and we manually curate um, a number of papers and put out lay summaries for them, but we're realizing that that's not scaling up adequately. So um, actually, um, I just joined forces with a number of people in computation linguistics to see if there are ways to automate lay summaries um, for scientific papers. So we can really, I, I think there are about uh, 20,000 papers being published per day. Um, so we need to start scaling up uh, explaining what is going on in science. So I was wondering if you had any pointers or any corpora, and I also wanted to put this out to the whole room. If people have corpora of lay summaries or thoughts on pointers on how to generate lay summaries from papers, I'd be, I'd be very interested. Okay, great. That's, that's a wonderful topic. So let me throw back to you the really deep conundrum on that, which is in the Houston book, I talked about um, what are called structured abstracts. And a lot of the bigger journals now, their writer's guidelines have gone to what they call structured abstract, which is giving you the template saying in your abstract, we want the first sentence. So it's, it's just forcing them into the ABT structure. And that's what it is. So it says the first, temp, the first sentence, tell us what the basic system is you're working in. Second sentence, tell us your problem. Third sentence, tell us your methods results, you know, and fourth sentence, yada, yada. Um, and it, that worries me because it, it meets the goal that you've got, which is it makes it much more readable. Uh, it's just like the MRAD template. 
But my worry is that you start to get the scientists, the narrative part of their brain is getting lazy. They're just filling in the blanks. And I think it's a good exercise for you once you finish the paper to have to spend some time boiling down what is the structure of this thing and not just having this fill in the blank structure. Um, you're not, or you're shaking your head. What, what are you thinking? Yes. Let's, uh, let's have I mean, a debate here. Good. I can talk about narrative structures all day. In fact, I love them. But um, uh, so, for, so that is intended in a, in a very particular realm, right? So these are sub languages and this is for a specific audience. Yeah. That's not what we consider a lay summary because still, still a structured summary and, and a structured abstract um, in general, for instance, it, it presumes a lot of background knowledge, it presumes a lot of knowledge of jargon. So it, it's a way to structure um, out, outcomes for, for that same audience. That's different from a lay summary. So I, I think there are a number of, number of different topics. Yeah. Um, one is what, is what is an appropriate summary for a lay audience? The other one is can scientists actually, do they have the skills to write that? Um, and I think that's exactly where your work perhaps fits in. Yeah, and, and so what, um, what I was tossing back to you is just this simple kind of conceptual divide between do you want to give the template to them, say fill in the blanks, or do you want to leave them on their own and say, you as a scientist need to learn what narrative structure is. You need to read your paper and think it through and structure it on your own as opposed to fill in the blanks. That's what worries me is the fill in the blanks approach is that you start to get a laziness with people's brains. So that's, that's the, uh, and by the way, one little side note, if I could, um, over here happens to be a poster, which I looked at just before I started my talk. And here's the abstract. And whoever wrote this poster did a really nice job with the ABT structure. Um, and you don't see it all the time, but this one is about uh, gen app layout and style enhancements. And the first three or four sentences maybe goes on a little long in the beginning there laying it out. But you see it gets to the word however, the same as but right there. However, the overall look and feel has been neglected. That's the statement of the problem. Doesn't have the word therefore, but you could drop it right in there. Therefore, we've addressed this through two consulting engagements, blah, blah, blah. That's it. It's not that complicated, but you wouldn't believe how many papers are published with editors having played a role in it that cut right to the chase. They start with the therefore. Uh, brain size in mice was measured seven different ways. They don't give you the setup. They don't state the problem. And it's okay. It's not that any of that stuff is factually wrong. It's just not the best narrative structure. It's not the easiest for people to, to digest and get at a deeper level. Um, let's see, and we want to look at a few of these ABTs. We're getting to, let's do one more question. Yeah, good. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for the presentation. I, I got some ideas sure. here, so I uh, well, well spent time here. Um, the question that I have is very pragmatic and somehow, somehow related to the automation question, but it's from a selfish perspective again. Uh, how do I know that I got it right? Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Got the, the structure right, basically? Yes. That's a wonderful question. We get that all the time. It's so funny. I, I wish I had Mike Strauss here. Mike Strauss was the head of Office of Science Quality Review for USDA for 12 years and has been my partner in developing a lot of this stuff along with two or three other people. And he ran about 15 circles there at USDA, and that's what would happen. So the fundamental exercise in story circles, there's two parts to the hour. The first half hours, we give you five abstracts like that, exactly like that one right there. And we would ask you to read over it and score it from one to 10. And if you think it's perfect ABT structure, you give it eight, nine or 10. I'd probably give that one, you know, an eight. I would mark it down a little bit because it went a little long at the beginning, but otherwise it's really close to a really good ABT. And then you make a few notes there. We give them 10 minutes to evaluate the five different abstracts. And by the way, numbers four and five are actually synopses of movies to try and show you that the same basic ABT principles work for these movies. Um, and then if it's a mess, you know, if it's all over the place, then you give it a score of two, three, or four, something like that, and you make a few notes. It had all the ABT elements. They're scrambled all over the place. And so what was starting to happen with the scientists at USDA, Mike would call me up, and he'd say, they would ask that very question. So what's the answer? You know, is this a seven or is it an eight? Where's the answer key? And he would say, I don't know. You tell me. Um, communication is massively subjective. It is not objective the way that working with chemicals or physics or something like that is. You're dealing with hugely variable audiences. And the place you get to see it in story circles that's wonderful is with those scores. Because if we were doing it here right now this morning, this is what we do at a demo day. You'd be broken into groups of five people. We'd give you the five abstracts. You'd put those scores on there. And then we'd start the discussion. You go around the circle, all five people. And we'd say, OK, what'd you give this one? And the first person I say, I gave it a nine. And the next person might say, I give it a two. And everybody bursts out laughing. How could you give it a, you thought it was perfect. You thought it was a mess. You gave it a two. And the scores are all over the map. And then you begin the discussion. The discussion begins with, why'd you give it a nine? Why'd you think it was so good? Why'd you give it a two? 
So you start to see what you're seeing there is real variation. Everybody's brain has different narrative perception. This whole audience here, you've all got different ways that you're perceiving stuff and you'll walk away with different messages that you got out of this thing. And that's the tough thing you've got with communication is understanding you're dealing with this hugely variable thing and it tracks it back then to not being able to give you a, a precise answer to how do you know you got it right. Other than the only answer to that question is one word, which is intuition. That's why we do story circles is slowly but surely over time, repetition, you begin to develop an intuitive feel for the right structure and you begin to realize this, this works. This actually got the setup, it's got that, and it's gonna hold the audience of an, of the attention of an audience. But beyond that, this is not a precise science. And you know, sorry if that's frustrating. Let me run through a few of these little um, ABTs I've got because I, I spotted I think some kind of interesting things in them. And let's see, we've got about maybe 10 minutes to do this. Uh, this is what we do at the end of the demo day. We call it an ABT build session. And what we have is everybody in the group writes their own ABTs. And then I just do like an hour and a half of this sort of freeform stuff. So okay, was our first <laughs> brave volunteer. And uh, you, actually you could, oh, um, you, you want to, um, yeah, why don't you come up here and, and you could read it. So here is um, what she sent yesterday. So um, can you read that? Yes. Okay, so here we go. It's kind of long. Yeah. <laughs> I gave two minutes to it. Wildfires are among most salient hazards with devastating impacts in California as well as the rest of the world. And there are existing computational models, IoT technologies, and data science methods for fire modeling. But there is a need for a cyber infrastructure platform that can integrate these components. Therefore, the Wi-Fi lab develops integrated infrastructure and systems for natural hazards monitoring, simulation, and decision support. Perfect, <laughs> okay, great. Um, and so, yeah, you can have a seat there. First off, I don't think anybody was confused or bored by that. That's the first great thing about the ABT is it makes it so concise that nobody's lost and everything's accurate in here. So that's all good. But now, let me point out some, this. This took me an hour or so. Brian came over yesterday and we read through these and he kind of helped me find some notes in them. And some of these things, I think we were doing this live in a demo day. I wouldn't have caught this. It was later last night that I looked at it again and realized um, this is very interesting. So um, in, in Hollywood, in screenwriting, this is one of the fundamental principles. When you're writing a story, you're talking about a character, you're telling the journey of this character who's fighting for some big goal. You break it down into wants versus needs. So the character wants something. That's the big, broad, general human thing that they're trying to achieve in the world. And then what do they need to achieve that? So for example, maybe I tell you, I want to save the world, make it a wonderful place. And what I need to be able to do that is I need to be elected president. So that's your fundamental difference between wants versus needs. And then I start taking a look at what you've got here. And so here's the first thing that we do is um, color code these things. Blue is usually for the um, the setup there, and red is for the, the problem statement, the contradiction, the but, and green usually for the therefore. And take a look at what you have there for the but. What's fascinating is look at the, the word you've got in there. You have the word need right in there. And what you've said here is, but there's a need for cyber infrastructure platform that can integrate these components. But now think about that. That's actually the tool that's needed. What's the more broad want? And that's kind of in the other part of the red there that can integrate these components. That's your want. We want to integrate the components. What do you need to be able to do that? Does that make sense? And so this is, this is what we do with the ABT, you know, and it seems trivial, but every little bit that you can tweak these things, adding them, getting them tighter, makes the logic better. The bigger part of the audience can follow you. So here's what I would suggest in a rewrite of that is rewrite the but part and say, but at present, this is the real problem, a lack of integration, um, of these components resulting in inefficiency, something to that effect, does that make sense? And, and one of the fascinating things we found, story circles, that I'm gonna, it's not in my books yet, but I'm gonna write about this, is I think there's a huge difference between verbal versus written formulation of these sorts of things. So over and over again, people will, um, and you're nodding your head, you've seen this before. Writer. You're a writer, exactly. People will write their ABTs and they'll be long and convoluted and things like that. And then we'll start in this thing and I'll come over and say, okay, what's, what's the basic problem here? And they'll start to look down and I'll say, no, don't look down. Just look at me. Tell me off the top of your head, what's the basic problem? And they'll come out with something like this, you know, well, we can't integrate the components in, like in five words and the whole group will go, wow, that's so clear. And <laughs> something goes on with the brain where verbally quite often you can say these things much more directly and clearly than as soon as you start writing, you just start turning them into spaghetti. So that's how I would probably suggest as a first draft rewrite on this, which is um, you move the need down to here, 
And in fact, you've probably got more detail than you need right there on um, integrated infrastructure systems, national model, blah, blah, blah. Not sure we need all, all that for this concise statement. It, isn't that all kind of encaptured by just cyber infrastructure platform? Those are all the specifics of it. So for something like this, if you wanted to be pretty concise, that's sort of what I would suggest. Um, at present, the problem is a lack of integration. Um, therefore, we're developing this tool, which will solve this problem. Is that making sense? Uh, I thought that was kind of fun because I've never had an example like this that hit on that wants versus needs thing because that's straight out of Hollywood. But that's a lot of what I've tried to do is pull these things out of Hollywood. By the way, what, for the sake of Brian and me, what is IoT technologies? <laughs> The what? I do that when I Oh, jeez. <laughs> Maybe you are more of a scientist than I am. Okay. Um, here's another one. We've got a few more minutes. Uh, Grant Miller. So let's see. Uh, can you read it from there? Okay. People might not understand my accent, but I'll try. Uh, online citizen science has been around for most of the 21st century, and it has benefited thousands of researchers. But setting up an online citizen science project is expensive and time consuming. Therefore, the Zooniverse has built a free and open platform that enables anyone to build a project quickly. Great, okay. And one of the great things with the ABT, use this with your graduate students, and you don't really even need to give them forewarning. Um, say, okay, right now, off the top of your head, I want you to tell me this one sentence, and but therefore, and they say, well, I need some time. No, you really don't. Just give it a shot, push them. First thing you'll see is their eyeballs roll back in their head as they're starting, and that's the narrative part of their brain activating. Okay, how am I gonna set this thing up? What is the problem? It's a great exercise to get them starting to clarify what they're doing. I do this a lot with groups of graduate students, just sit around a circle and have everybody you know, come up with these ABTs. And so on this one, so then this is the first thing that we do, as I said, you know, go use this color coding, identifying the setup statements here and the uh, problem and then the, the solution. And uh, that ABT is really pretty simple and pretty clear. So, you know, I don't have a ton of stuff. I think the whole audience followed along just fine with it. But I do have one little suggestion. And keep in mind, all this stuff, it's super subjective. Again, this is not like analytical chemistry or whatever. This is dealing with a lot of variability and it's got an art element to it and it's kind of optimization. But here's one little thought I had on this, which is um, the goal with the ABT is to you work on it so long and hard that every single word in there is there for a reason. There's no extraneous stuff. There's no repetition. Um, everything is needed. And so when you start to look at this, um, look at the first part. Online citizen science has been around for most 21st century, uh, and it's benefited thousands of researchers, but setting up online citizen projects expensive and time consuming. Um, could you be more specific here? And here's one of the things that we've kind of uncovered in working with this ABT is all else equal. And this is my buddy Park Howell with that podcast, actually. He's worked a lot with it now. We're constantly having long discussions seems to be two main things you want to get up front in your setup. And, and this is the context for your whole project, which is you want to begin by getting us into the ordinary world. What is the basic system that you're working in? And then if possible, can you tell us what's at stake? Why is this important? This is the thing I always had trouble with my proposals when I was a scientist was failing to make a compelling case for why do we even need to fund this research? It's so important for uh, research proposals. And so those two elements. Um, now we take a look at what you've got here. And you've got online citizen science been around for most 20th century. Um, is that a really crucial piece of information to this narrative? It's kind of interesting background, whatever. But if we're really trying to make the case about um, your problem, which is that it's expensive and time consuming, don't know that that's that essential. Um, and even the fact that, well, the benefit of thousands, that is part of why, why it's um, uh, valuable, what's at stake. So here's what I might suggest as a little bit of a, a restructuring of it. Uh, organizations, and, and you tell me if this makes any sense, organizations form citizen science groups, and the benefits can include whatever three big attributes that you can think of, larger data sets, community participation, inexpensive science. The, the power of storytelling rests in the specifics. So a lot of times you don't want to get into a lot of details of these things, but one or two or three specifics can help make them much more powerful. And that's what I would suggest there, because that's starting to give us a clear idea of how it benefits actually. So your, your version said it's benefited thousands. If we can get into these specifics right here, which isn't going on too long, then we can really see, wow, you're right, that's really powerful and beneficial. As a matter of fact, what you really want, it's kind of like the core um, dynamic of all communication is don't tell us, show us. Can you show us some data? Can you show us these attributes that are gonna result in us saying, wow, that benefits a lot of people with those sorts of things. Then I would think you'd say that, 
Um, and then follow into, uh, but setting up is expensive and time consuming. Um, I don't know. Does that make sense or not? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, so we, we can go back and forth on that. Um, but that's, that's what you do in this process. And it seems like you know, splitting hairs, but actually every little bit is super important. The key dynamic is you're wanting to make a statement that is both concise, as short as possible, and yet still retaining enough substance to be compelling. And last one we'll do here is Jeanette. Um, and Jeanette there, okay, great. Um, and let's see, you want, you want to read this to us? Can you see it from there? Sure. The rate of ice sheet melting is not well understood and several scientific com communities are studying it by collecting data and by computational modeling. But these communities of scientists are not well unified. Therefore, we are trying to build a gateway that will allow these scientists to make progress on characterizing this problem. Okay, great. Um, so let's take a look at your setup there. Um, and this is what um, I was wondering if there's a little bit of redundancy in what you've got in the setup and the statement of the problem. And in fact, try this out. The study of ice sheet melting is multidisciplinary, which is sort of what you're saying there. Um, and then why does it matter if it's multidisciplinary? What do we know about the characteristics of multidisciplinary science? Um, we know the multidisciplinary studies require a unified approach. And then we get to the but, and the but is, uh, but this isn't happening for um, sheeting melting, sorry, <laughs> typo there, for melting, ice, um, but ice, ice sheets melting uh, because of, and therefore we're delving del gateway. So it's about boiling it down and trying to get it to the least number of words. And one of the basic dynamics that we've also uncovered is that the quicker you can get through the A and the B, the more we'll let you have all day on the T. And you can go on and on because if you can get us through a little bit of setup and get us right to the core of what the problem is, then we're engaged with you now, and we may not even agree with you and the approach you're taking, you're there for, but we're now really listening, and which, okay, now I know what the problem is. Are they taking the approach I would take? And if not, why not? And now you got a whole discussion. But the mistake that gets made is if you go on and on with the and, 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 and then you get in the butt and you present three different problems that you're working on, you've lost this after a while. So there's a whole, as I said, almost fractal nature of this thing that people talk about nested ABTs, and you can, if you start us off with a simple one that pulls us right in, then down the line, you can give us more ABTs and get us in these other facets. That's the art of the whole thing. It takes so much time working on it, distilling it, but that's what you eventually want is really well ABT structured material that's just constantly working this problem solution dynamic at all different scales. And ultimately, this is the big challenge for scientists is can you find the singular narrative because the world of narrative and storytelling and all that sort of stuff our brains are programmed for the singular narrative. They really have a hard time. And social psychologists are beginning to do studies that, that reveal this. And one last little tip I'll give you here if you're really deep on this stuff. There's a tremendous paper in 2009 by Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times, three-time Pulitzer Prize winner, that in all places is published in Outside Magazine. And the title of it is Nicholas Kristof Saves the World. And that article from 2009 is, I try and reread it every few months. It is so good and powerful. And in there, he draws on some of the social psychology literature, a few little experiments and things to show you things like this, this singular narrative. The idea that um, he, he talks about public health campaigns in, in Africa and that if you even tell the story of two people, it's less powerful than the story of one person. Everything in narrative comes boiling down to the power of the one. There's a kind of semi-shallow book that was a bestseller in 2012 called The One Thing. And it's all about, you know, you got to figure out what's the one thing, the central singular narrative. That's how narrative works. And the problem for scientists, as you know, is you're raised your whole science life to cherish the large data set. And you end up with this deep intuitive feeling like more is more. And, you know, I want to hear 10 stories instead of just the one. And I think that's a really fundamental cultural divide in the mindset of the science world with this narrative world. And it's really tough to resolve, but it is, if you put in enough time, I think you can crack the nut and solve these sorts of things. So that's um, enough for this morning. Hopefully everybody got these cards, which are just kind of a synopsis, the ABT framework stuff that we use in our workshops. And I'm around for the next couple hours. And then, as I said, please send me emails. I love hearing thoughts and comments and discussion. And uh, come on up, ask questions if you got anything. So thank you, hope that was worthwhile. Yeah.